This is the Fairphone 5, the company's fifth attempt at making a phone that is repairable as well as fair to both the planet and the people who make it. With the company's earlier devices, the cost of fairness was always extra bulk, worse performance, and a much less attractive price than the regular competition. But with the 5, they claim that that penalty is now smaller than ever. I've been testing this phone for almost a month now to see if that is true, and I've also read every 70-page environmental analysis, financial statement, and mining reports that I could find to figure out what their challenges really are, whether the high prices that they're charging you are really fair, or whether all of this is really just greenwashing. Or I guess it would be fair washing in this case, but anyway, while I was researching that, this also happened. We are in the process of eliminating eliminating all plastic from our packaging by the end of next year. 300 suppliers have committed to using 100% clean, renewable electricity. Everyone's talking about sustainability these days, so I've also been looking into whether you even need a Fairphone in the first place these days. Let's find out. This video was sponsored by our streaming service, Nebula. The first Fairphone ever made came out 10 years ago, in 2013, and as the founders tell the story, they never actually planned to make a phone. Instead, they first ran an awareness campaign about conflict minerals, trying to convince others to build electronics more ethically. Then, as the famous Foxconn suicides brought the world's attention to the terrible conditions in factories too, Fairphone's organizers decided that they would just do it themselves. They would build a phone the way they thought phones should be built. Well, actually, the Fairphone 1 was a pretty humble step into that direction, as they were a tiny team with zero experience. They used an off-the-shelf design that they basically just slapped their own logo on, and the device was both designed and made completely by their Chinese partner called Guo Hong. Fairphone's achievement was basically limited to making sure that workers at Guo Hong were treated decently, and also to making sure that some fair trade materials were used in the production. The company sold 60,000 units of this, well, very mediocre device, which was not a lot, but it did prove that there was some kind of a business there. And then for the Fairphone 2, they acquired enough capabilities to design their own phone basically from scratch, they switched to better suppliers, and the result was the first device with what I think is real Fairphone DNA. From the modular, repairable design to seven plus years of software support at a time when most Android phones were lucky to get even one, but of course also to a completely lackluster price to performance ratio, this was a fair phone through and through. I mean, this thing was bulky as hell, the cameras and the performance were pretty painful, and it cost twice as much as comparably spec phones, but yes indeed, it was modular, so you know, the formula was there and they could now iterate and improve on it. With the Fairphone 3, they got rid of the bulk and shrunk down the device to a much sleeker size. With the 4, they finally got a Snapdragon 750 chip, making performance at least manageable. And by the 5, I think they've actually fixed almost all the biggest pain points. I used this device for almost 4 weeks, and while I definitely don't think it will beat or even quite match other devices at its price point, I also think it is a completely usable device now. And so here's my mini review of both how good it is and how fair it is. So physically, the 5 is just a millimeter or two thicker than modern iPhones, and its weight sits right between the iPhone 15 Pro and the Pro Max with their fancy lightweight titanium frames. The Fairphone doesn't feel quite as fancy as a regular flagship phone, but especially with the solid aluminum frame, I have no real complaints. One clear advantage of it, beyond just the ability to swap components, is that the backplate likely won't crack, unlike on glass models, and if it does, it costs less than 25 euros to get a new one. In contrast, for a quick comparison, Apple got a lot of good press this year for making their rear glass easier and cheaper to repair, which is genuinely great, but even on the smaller non-pro iPhone 15, that still costs 199 euros to be fixed here in Germany. Now, there's a concept in electronics called the modularity penalty, which is that in order to make something easy to disassemble and reassemble again, you actually have to add a whole lot of connectors and material and everything has to become more bulky and less nice. This not only makes devices less nice to use, but actually partially chips away at any environmental savings that you might get from modularity. This was abundantly clear with the Fairphone 2, which had gigantic latches and complicated connectors, but by the 4 and the 5, this penalty has gotten impressively small. You can swap out 11 modules on the 5 now, which is more than ever, and yet they managed to limit the extra bulk quite well. Also, a massive study from the German Fraunhofer Institute took a look at the Fairphone 4, so that 
the predecessor of the five and found that there was only a 1-2% to penalty in extra emissions from all these extra materials needed for the modularity, so we can basically claim that this issue has largely been fixed. And by the way, throughout this video, I'm going to be referencing this study from the Fraunhofer Institute, which is about the four, because this is a really high quality third party independently verified study that we don't have about the five yet, but there's a whole lot of really good information in there that I think we can learn a lot from. Anyway, I have noticed two areas where modularity is a clear downside. First is waterproofing, as without a tight integration, you can't really seal everything up as much. That's a real trade-off, but even here, Fairphone has managed to achieve a fairly respectable IP55 rating. That means that the phone should survive rain and even an accidental drop into, I don't know, a bathtub or something, but not much more than that. And second is the battery. There is no wireless charging due to the removable backplate, I guess, and the cell is also slightly smaller than in most flagships at 4,200 milliamp hours. I guess this is because in order to be removable, the battery needs a larger and more rigid casing. Still, this is significantly bigger than any battery in a Fairphone before it, and actual battery life is still pretty decent. I easily got through each one of my days with it, with typically 5 to 7 hours of screen on time, mostly spent indoors, and the 30 watt charging speed meant getting from 0 to 50% in just 20 minutes. That is a decent, even if not amazing value in my opinion, plus you can carry a spare that Fairphone sells you for just under 40 euros. For contrast, Apple will swap a battery on the cheapest iPhone 15 model for 109 euros here in Germany. Now I've learned from that study from Fraunhofer Institute that on the Fairphone 4 at least, the battery only made up a surprisingly small part of the environmental footprint of the phone, which is only about 3-6% to and I think on the Fairphone 5 it should be even better. And that is in part because batteries are one of the few components that are custom made for each phone model, so Fairphone can have a lot of control over theirs. Almost all of the key materials in the Fairphone 5's battery are fair trade or recycled as you can see here, and they're pretty easy to recycle at the end of their life as well. Now I've noticed that Apple actually one upped Fairphone here in at least one way by making sure that they use 100% recycled cobalt in their iPhone 15 series batteries, which is perhaps the most problematic material in there, so kudos to Apple, but Fairphone did really really well here overall. Okay, and now moving on to the screen. Fairphone historically used LCD screens as those were cheaper and they didn't burn in with time, but the company clearly thinks that OLED tech has finally gotten durable enough for the 5. They thankfully also finally opted for a 90Hz panel that has both really high resolution and gets bright enough at 800 nits of peak brightness to work well even outdoors on a sunny day. And you can also swap your display in about 5 minutes and get a replacement part for just under 100 euros. And for contrast again, Apple will fix a broken iPhone 15 screen for 339 euros. Now moving on to cameras, this is definitely the area where Fairphone struggled the most in the past, but I think with the 5 they've actually arrived to a place that is maybe not category leading, but definitely serviceable. So there's a regular and an ultra wide, and the overall quality is just fine. Daylight photos look decent even if slightly less impressive than from modern flagships, and the indoor shots are perfectly serviceable too. The ultra wide performed surprisingly well as a macro camera, letting me get some really nice shots of this beautiful wasp nest, and while it impressed me a lot Class for landscape shots, actually nighttime photos easily beat my admittedly low expectations. I thought these shots would be terrible and they're actually pretty good. Without night mode you do see more dynamic range issues than you would on other devices and once I even had this happen to me on a selfie, but about 90% of the time I was definitely satisfied with the cameras, which is very much not what previous Fairphone cameras were like. Better yet, you can now individually swap each of the three cameras instead of having to swap the whole module all at once, and you can see the prices for each of them on screen right now. Apple only allows you to swap the whole rear module all at once for 199 euros on the cheapest iPhone 15, and there's no quote for the selfie camera at all, so maybe that needs replacing the whole screen or something similar, I have no idea. Now cameras are actually a type of semiconductor, at least the sensors inside of them are, and this is actually where we start bouncing into one of the clear limitations of Fairphone's sustainability approach. 
According to our beloved Fraunhofer Institute study, you can see that ICs, which is short for integrated circuits, also known as chips, are one of the largest contributors to the Fairphone 4's emissions, along with related components like connectors and the printed circuit board that they sit on. This is because you need a ton of energy and water to make these components and because these use a lot of precious materials. The problem is that Fairphone has very little to no control over how almost any of the chips in their devices are made. Sony, Qualcomm, etc. and their fabs like TSMC and Samsung are not going to change their designs and their manufacturing processes for a company that sells phones in the hundreds of thousands. That's right, despite the growth, none of their models have even reached the 200,000 mark yet. This is a genuine Achilles heel of the Fairphone strategy. I mean, they can use recycled plastic for their back, they can use recycled aluminum for their frame, recycle the fair trade materials for the battery, but they have very little control over what their chips are made of. Now, talking of chips, the phone has a very unusual one from Qualcomm called the QCM6490, which was not originally made for phones, but rather for industrial applications. So the idea here is that Fairphone wants to provide at least 8, but hopefully 10 years of updates with at least 5 Android version upgrades for this device. Qualcomm doesn't support its phone chips for that long, and after that support ends, a manufacturer kind of has to hack together updates by itself. In the past, Fairphone fought Qualcomm very publicly over this, but with the 5, Fairphone finally got big enough to where they established a good direct relationship with Qualcomm, who helped them get one of the special chips. Industrial machines don't get swapped out every three years or so, unlike the average smartphone, so Qualcomm actually supports these chips for way longer. That, in turn, should make it much easier for Fairphone to support their phones. And I guess it doesn't hurt to have Qualcomm as an ally rather than as an enemy. Fairphone's CEO even told us that they're now pitching Qualcomm to have modular chips, kind of like how desktop PCs have socketed CPUs that you can swap, which I honestly don't think is very feasible. But anyway, it's clear that even just having this much scale is slowly allowing Fairphone to have much more control over its key suppliers like Qualcomm. Now, as for the performance of the device, this is somewhere in the mid-range category. Here are some benchmark numbers for you benchmark lovers. Definitely not a prime choice for gamers, and I suspect that stuttering will become noticeable even after just a few years of use, but it handled all the messaging and scrolling that I threw at it during my few weeks with it just fine. As for the rest of the device, everything else felt similarly okay, except for three minor annoyances that I had. First, Bluetooth connectivity is somehow a little weaker than on my other phones, so I occasionally get a little bit of stuttering over my earphones. Now, this might just be a problem of my review unit being an early production sample, but the problem is occasionally noticeable. And next, the vibration motor and the loudspeakers are both noticeably less premium than on other phones. Now, Fairphone specifically calls out these two components as having recycled rare earths and magnets, as well as highlighting the factory at which these components are made as being one of their key components concerns, so I guess these are components where they chose fairness over just quality. These are a little bit annoying from a user experience perspective, but I guess for the eco-conscious consumer, these are not going to be real deal breakers. And I think the Fairphone 5 is overall a pretty well-rounded device. So if you want something that is repairable and modular and fair, then I think you're going to be pretty happy with the 5. Of course, as Fairphone themselves will point out, the most eco-conscious thing that you can do is to not buy a new phone in the first place. and to keep whatever you buy for as long as possible, so the next question is how well Fairphone is doing in terms of longevity. Well, the Fairphone 1 only got support for three and a half years due to Fairphone having little control over the actual device. The 2 got more than seven years of software support, including five actual Android version upgrades, which is way longer than they promised at launch, and for the majority of that time, components were on sale too. That is pretty good. And meanwhile, the 3 and the 4 are still fully supported right now, both are promised 5 years of software support, with Fairphone hoping to over-deliver on that promise like they did with the 2, and both still have all the components in stock at the time of writing. As for the 5, Fairphone promises 8 years of updates and hopes for 10, with at least 5 Android version upgrades as well, since they no longer have to circumvent Qualcomm for updates anymore. That is a pretty respectable track record, and there's also support for all the custom ROMs you could imagine, as well as even a pretty insane 5 years of warranty. That's kind of unprecedented. So that's good, but does all of this actually lead to increased longevity? Well, in their 2022 financial report,
report, Fairphone claims that their users keep devices on average for five and a half years versus the industry standard of two to three years. That's great, and I guess that for the Fairphone 5, those figures should get even longer as the device got better. Which means that yes, there is some kind of a longevity benefit. Now, would the type of consumer who wants to get a Fairphone also have kept their iPhone or Samsung or similar device for a really long time as well beyond the average consumer? I guess so, unless they somehow managed to break it in a way that was impossible to repair or at least impossibly expensive to repair. After all, regular phones last pretty long these days as well if you take good care of them. And finally, everyone from Apple to Samsung and Google are offering five or more years of updates on their devices too. Also, we're finally seeing real right to repair legislation in multiple countries, including mandates to stock spare parts for longer. We're seeing that the EU in particular is soon mandating that batteries be more easily repairable by users. And we're seeing everyone from Samsung to Google and Apple offering spare parts and manuals for cell repair as well, etc. So clearly repair is slowly becoming less and less of an issue industry-wide. In a way, it's easier than ever to keep using any device for longer, not just a Fairphone, if people actually want to keep using them, that is. Still, Fairphone did this better and earlier than any other brand and their support of spare parts is still second to none. So for those who want to truly stick around, it might still be the ultimate phone. And if anything, they deserve credit for showing the industry just how much is possible. Now, beside that, I was also always wondering why Fairphones are so expensive. Like, is the cost of fairness really that high or are they just to ripping us off. Thankfully, Fairphone actually releases their financial statements just to be extra transparent. And in these, we can see that the company made a final profit of just 44,000 euros last year. That is basically nothing. It's a profit margin of way less than 1%. And while their three year average is slightly better at 5%, that is still way below the margins of Apple and most other really successful electronics giants. This is a vastly oversimplified way of looking at a business, but I've actually read their financial statements. And the short of it is that, yeah, running a business like this with these crazy warranties and complex supply chains and everything, it is just this expensive. They're not really ripping you off. But this also tells me two different things. First, in a way, it's not that Fairphone is too expensive, but rather that everyone else is too cheap. Exploiting fewer people in mines and in factories and using more recycled materials, etc. has a price, and the majority of the industry just chooses not to pay it. But second, also Fairphone's biggest problem, in my opinion, is scale. 10 years in, Fairphone is still selling phones in the hundreds of thousands, while the Samsung and the Apples of the world are in the hundreds of millions. The company hasn't even officially expanded past Europe, except for a recent partnership to sell through a small partner called Morena in the US. Making such a complicated design with such a unique supply chain and supporting it for 10 years or whatever is super expensive, especially when you can't spread those costs out over millions of units, and especially if you don't have the proper economies of scale for production. Without scale, they can't push Qualcomm and Sony and all of their other suppliers to do better either, so it even hinders their sustainability goals, and the lack of scale hurts their recycling efforts as well, in my opinion. So Fairphone claims to be an e-waste neutral company, meaning that for each phone or device that they sell, they will actually recycle an equivalent amount of electronics products, be it an older Fairphone or whatever electronics device that they can plug out of a landfill in Ghana or something similar. This is great, and I commend them for it, but they can't actually do something that, ironically, Apple does pretty well. There's plenty to complain about with Apple, including how they basically started the trend of glued together unrepairable electronics, or how they still do parts pairing, which is where they will artificially basically break your phone if you repair it through anything other than the company's own official repair channels. But one place where their enormous scale has given them a remarkable advantage is recycling. Apple has literally custom made and designed robots that will individually individually disassemble an iPhone into its components or lets them recycle their raw materials much more cleanly. Now, I don't know if overall Apple does as well in terms of recycling as Fairphone does, because they don't actually promise to match their sales volumes with the recycled volumes, unlike Fairphone. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that scale is a superpower and Fairphone doesn't have it. Now for this video, as I said, I had to read through literally hundreds of pages of environmental reports and fair trade certification documents and whatnot to give you some properly researched and properly drawn conclusions, but I think it was worth it. I'm an absolute sucker for well-researched video essays that are made with genuine care, and if you are too, then I think you'll find so many of your soon-to-be-favorite shows over on Nebula. 
hundreds of the best educational creators, including Climate Town, Not Just Bikes, Wendover, Yours Truly, and more, got together to build a video streaming service of our own that is filled with not just our regular content, but also Nebula Originals. So many great originals. You're not looking at episodes, by the way. These are individual shows, many with dozens of episodes, and I've discovered many of my favorite video essays of the year right here. I absolutely love a good Lindsay Ellis analysis, like this newest one that is breaking down the bizarre ways that Las Vegas tried to appeal to families with kids, while also trying to be a gambling town that is great. I keep raving about Red Atoms covering the Soviet nuclear program, which has just launched new episodes not long ago, and there is so much good stuff for the curious mind here. These originals are only possible because of the generous funding by Nebula subscribers, and I myself have made over a dozen Nebula exclusive bonus videos, plus a whole eight-part Nebula original series called Technorama as well. Originals are on top of all of our usual videos, which come out ad-free and often early access on Nebula. And in addition, we also have the Nebula Classes platform, where creators, including me, teach a bunch of things that we think we are really good at. I think this is the cleanest trade of the industry. You give us money, and we give you more and better content. There are no ads, no shady tracking, nothing else. Just good content made with genuine care. If you use my link, which you can find down in the description, you'll even get an annual subscription for just $30 a year. That is $20 off versus just signing up using a generic link, so be sure to use my link when you sign up, and that way Nebula will also know that I sent you.